Good evening, good people. Good evening. My name is Carla Dupre, the Executive Director of City Lit Project, located in Baltimore, Maryland. Welcome. We're midway through our 19th annual City Lit Festival in full swing. And we're so excited about this particular masterclass with this particular author. Tonight's session is a highly anticipated one. Since we've wanted to have Kiesi, Kiese join us in Baltimore for quite some time. And this virtual experience is the next best thing to having him here in person. Like many things that have happened to us this festival season, we can't believe our good luck. And we're even more fortunate to have you as writers joining us this evening. Before we begin tonight's session, we'd like to acknowledge that the land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. We are currently on the traditional lands of the Piscataway people who are stewarded throughout generations. To make this a more meaningful practice, if you live in this region, we respectfully ask you to consider learning more about the Piscataway Kano tribe, the people where the rivers blend, and to invest energy in learning more about the land buyback movement for tribal nations. And as Native American friend once told me, even learning more about nature and the plants we grow is an investment in honoring tribal nations. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in the hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We acknowledge we are standing on ancestral lands and we honor the thousands of enslaved Africans whose lives were physically and spiritually stolen. We pay respect to the elders, past and present. I wanna take a moment to thank our new partnerships tonight for this festival and to bask in the idea that even with a bomb cyclone in our mix, we had us one dang good day long festival this weekend at the Pratt. For those of us, for those who missed our sessions on becoming American, our craft intensive on writing creative nonfiction, our one-on-one -on -one 30 minute critique sessions, our nod to bell hook session on black girls, bone black and breathing, and our spirited keynote with Nicole Hannah Jones and Martha S. Jones, we will have a number of those sessions posted on the City Lit YouTube channel in a few days. But there's a reason to celebrate tonight too, as this year City Lit has forged incredible new partnerships with the following organizations to bring the light of literature to your living rooms, to your screens, and to the three live events with two of them upcoming at the Motor House on Tuesday, March 29th, and at Busboys and Poets Baltimore on Friday, April 1st. So mark your calendars. City Lit thanks the Maryland Centers for Creative Classrooms, Maryland Humanities, Arts Education in Maryland Schools, Motor House, Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, Busboys and Poets Baltimore, Be More Art Magazine, who is the media sponsor for this festival, the Ivy Bookshop, the independent bookseller for the festival, who will sell the author's books tonight, Joyful Signing with Suzanne Lightburn and Coffee Lemons tonight from um, as our ASL interpreters, Sister with a Bike Travel, Enoch Pratt Free Library, and a huge thank you to our graphic design team, Inside 180, who has created these beautiful, well, our, our um, Joe Massa, our um, City Lake Gladiator, produced these, but we have a program that Inside 180 produced that we just hope you get a hold of. Here's our flyers, they do beautiful work. But more than anything, we thank our funders and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm personally very thankful to have a wonderful family and a boss city lit team, some of who are joining us tonight. And I wanna name them because we are a very small literary arts organization in Baltimore with the staff of one, yours truly, and six board members. We have Dana Harris Travato, can you just wave? Our board chair, Brian Lyles, our immediate past chair. Chelsea Lemon Fetzer, our vice chair. Aditya Desai, our secretary. Bunky Merkert, a treasurer. Our brand spanking new board member, Tracy Diamond, and our incredible baptism by Festival Fire, Joe Massa. Our festival theme this year is how we break free, confronting hard truths. Casey Lehman is in so many ways, needs no introduction. I met him years ago at AWP in Miami with Michelle Philgate on a program about difficult relationships. I had read some of his work, but he was a force on that panel. And I knew there, then and there, not everyone held that kind of honesty and authenticity. It's not often you stumble upon an author who brings you the unfettered truth and sets it down in front of you and says, take it for what it's worth. His brutal honesty speaks to the way we regard pain and the complexities of the people we love. It speaks to the fluidity of how we see ourselves, our physical and the spiritual weight we carry, our passions and goals, and the honest realization of our relationships with ourselves and those around us. Kiese Lemon 
is a black Southern writer from Mississippi, the author of the genre building novel, Long Division, and the essay collection, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America. His best-selling memoir, Heavy, an American memoir, was named one of the best, the 50 best memoirs of the past 50 years by the New York Times, and it is no wonder. It's not, an oft, not often an author buys back two of his books because he wants to reissue them in a manner that he wants to, and not what the publishing industry dictates, and gets a 2022 NAACP Image Award for an outstanding work of literature with his novel, Long Division. These past two, three years, due to a pandemic, both a virus and a racial one, we have sheltered in place in a home that has been many, been where many of us had to do it. Homes mean many things to many people. Some of us might be strangers in our own homes. Some of us find comfort in our homes, but some of us find pain and heartache. Tonight, we will have a chance to explore that. I'd like to share a few quotes from Kiese Lemon that might find purchase with you. And these are just, there's so many, but these are the ones that I was able to gather tonight. And don't fight when you're angry, think when you're angry, write when you're angry, we read when you're angry. Here's another one. Not so deep down, we all know that safety is an illusion, that only character melds us together. That's why most of us do everything we can, healthy and unhealthy, to ward off that real feeling of standing alone, so close to the edge of the world. Mostly, I wondered what black writers weren't writing when we spent so much creative energy begging white folk to change. And two more. I will wonder if the memories that remain with age are heavier than the ones we forget because they mean more to us. If or, or if our bodies, like our nation, eventually purge memories we never wanted to be true. And the last one. Most groups of men I knew were good at destroying women and girls who, could, who would do everything not to destroy them. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Kiesi Lehman. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, Carla. Um, I'm, I'm just very, very grateful to, uh, to know you and, and to be chosen by you to come here. I also wanna um, thank you for the introduction too. I also wanna thank uh, the folks I met before we got on here, Suzanne, Kafi, Aditya, uh, Tracy, and Dana. And I especially want to just thank all of City Lab for, for making reading and writing, um, reminding me and reminding a lot of us of reading and writing um, our holy spaces, regardless of what one feels about um, uh, belief or spirituality. So um, what I want to do, y'all, today is I want to make the most of the time we have. So what I, what I want to do is I want to lead us through some writing exercises. We're about to all collectively make individual pieces, but in the next 45 minutes or so. After that time, I'm going to ask a few of you if you'd like to share some of what you've um, uh, made. You do not have to at all. I think sometimes it can, it can help the space to breathe if a few people sometimes volunteer. If you don't want to volunteer, you don't have to volunteer. Um, I also just want to say before we start, uh, you know, some of my friends always say that I make too many sports metaphors and I'm hard headed. So I'm about to make another sports metaphor. Um, you know, like I used to play a lot of basketball in high school and college. And back when I used to play a lot of basketball, people used to always be like, you know, to make a shot, you have to have like perfect form. You know, ball has to go over here that you have to follow through. And thank goodness somebody named Steph Curry came along and started shooting it from his chest. And so I'm saying all that to say, I'm about to give you all an exercise. Um, and it's really an exercise you can use when you feel like you're quote unquote stuck, but this is just an exercise. Like with shooting, just like with writing, it's like, it doesn't matter like what form you use necessarily, if the form works for you, if the form is healthy for you, and if you can create what you wanna create with the form, this is just another form. What we're gonna do tonight is this first part of this exercise called pick your garden. And we're going to go through it a little faster than we might normally go through it because we don't have as much time as I would want to do this. Um, but the idea of pick your garden came to me because um, my mother had me when she was 19 and she went to grad school at University of Wisconsin. And when she went to grad school, I went to stay with my grandmother. And my grandmother had the most incredible garden um, in this place called Forest in Scott County, Mississippi. And when she got home from, from working at the chicken plant, we'd often have to go out and, and pick the garden. 
And I didn't like vegetables. You know, I hated cucumbers, but I love pickles, right? I didn't like black eyed peas, but I loved pickles on black eyed peas. Um, I liked the feel of okra, though I did not like the taste of okra unless it was fried. And eventually I, found, I, I was like, damn, I don't like any of this shit I'm picking from grandmama's garden. But there's a way that she can prepare it and we can collectively prepare it that makes it not just digestible, but actually good. So the idea behind what we're about to do today is that like it, it works on this premise that we all have gardens to pick, right? And that garden can be the imagination, it can be the memory. And today we're gonna focus that garden on something we call home, right? And I'm wholly aware that some folks in here might not have physical homes of them. And you do not have to have a physical home to do this exercise. So when I say home, you know, I'm, I'm, I am talking about physical spaces and I'm also talking about the psychological space that a lot of us call home, okay? So I just wanna set that out, set that first. So again, this is gonna be a truncated version of what we usually do. We're gonna ask to some people at the end to see if you wanna like jump in and maybe share. And then I'm gonna leave some time for y'all if y'all wanna ask me some questions or talk about some other things. And again, I just wanna thank you so much for being here. And I just wanna thank you dearly, Carla, for making this possible. Okay, we're about to write. For the next 30, 35 minutes, we're gonna all be doing something. This exercise is premised on the attempt to obliterate cliche. First of all, right? We want to use as concrete a language as possible when we mine our memory. And that's what we're all about to do. We're all about to mine our memories slash imagination. All right, so the first thing I want you to do is we're gonna get sensory. I want you to use 10 concrete words to describe something that you've only smelled at home. Use 10 concrete words to describe something that you've only smelled at home. I'm going to give you about two minutes to do that. And I want you to keep writing while I'm talking. But if I ask you to mine a sense that you do not have access to, please just mine another sense, right? Like if you do not have access to smell, if you don't have access to taste, if you do not have access to feel, you can use other senses that you might have access to, right? But this the first one is use 10 words to describe something you only smell at home. Concrete. And as we go forward, feel, feel, feel comfortable to go backwards too if you haven't finished. And the next one is y'all, I want you to use 10 concrete words to describe something you only taste at home. 10 concrete words to describe something you only taste at home. And y'all, even though, keep, keep writing as I talk, and even though I say that, you know, part of what we're doing is attempting to obliterate cliche. Sometimes before we can obliterate or move something to the side, we have to see it, 
So if <laughs> if your 10 words for describing something you taste or smell are almost are all initially cliche, but you also just want to use this time to like use your, you know, if you're typing, or if you're writing, yeah, maybe you have to start with the cliche to get more concrete. But the ultimate goal of this exercise should be to move through cliche into the concrete words. Um, so again, so far I'm asking you 10 concrete words to describe something you only smell at home, 10 concrete words to describe something you only taste at home. All right. And the next one, and again, if you need to go back, go back. And the next one is use 10 concrete words to describe something you only feel at home. This is where you have a lot more line, like a lot more latitude, right? Like, do you, when I say feel, do you think like texture, right? Like using your feet, your hands, using your, your ears, your eyes, whatever. And, or are you thinking something that more comes from inside of your chest and your head? Whatever it is, 10 concrete words to describe something you only feel at home. Again, y'all keep on writing as I talk a little bit. This part of the exercise is sort of just to get us warmed up a bit, but also to give us an opportunity to look at a, a document, a page, a notebook, whatever you're writing in, and see like, like concretized like word patterns ultimately that bring us slash you like into parts of your home that we might not take time to actually like smell and taste and feel. I spent a lot of time um chasing smells in my work uh but when i'm actually hit with a smell that takes me back home to a place i don't want to go a room i might not want to go into i run away from the smell understandably and this exercise i'm kind of asking you like to, to to not run away from the smell to not run away from the taste to not run away from the feel and let's see what happens in the next 20 30 minutes if we allow ourselves to kind of linger in those things that we might normally not make time for so after this part of the exercise, y'all, there should be 30 concrete words. You know, they don't have to be uh, sentences. They don't have to necessarily be adjectives or nouns, but they, but they, but they should, to, to some degree, be concrete. Concrete words to describe that something you only smell, only taste, and only feel at home. Okay. All right. The second part of the exercise is, you know, it's all big one thing. We're all building this together. And this is where I think it can get a little, like I want you all to protect yourself um, while delving, while mining these memories and mining the imagination. Ask yourself if you are ready to mine this part of your imagination or this part of your memory. If you feel that you might not be ready, don't do it, right? If you feel spiritually, if you feel intellectually, if you feel bodily that you don't want to mine, the next thing is I'm about to ask, do not do it. Part of writing the stuff we do, particularly if we're writing essay, memoir, poetry, and some fiction, is you have to know when you, you know, you lead with your heart, you also have to know when you protect your heart and your body. Okay. So the next part of this exercise is what is the most joyful, affirming sentence you've heard at home? What is the most joyful, affirming sentence? you've heard at home. Take a few minutes. And when we talk about the most joyful affirming sentence you've heard, we also mean the most joyful affirming sentence that someone might have signed to you, right? We're not, we're not, we're not solely speaking of like the auditory. You do not have to have heard this sentence, but this sentence has to have been conveyed to you through some means. The second part of this is 
what is the most joyful affirming sentence you've said and or communicated at home? So the first part ask you, like, what is the sentence that you felt or you've heard communicated to you the most affirming joyful sentence? The second part is what's the most joyful affirming sentence that you've said and or communicated at home? This part of the exercise, there should be two sentences. Again, keep working on those sentences if you haven't gotten them now yet. Um, and, and, and also, y'all, remember, please take care of yourself as you do this exercise as best you can. The next sentence, the next question, you know, this is, again, we're picking our garden. We're going out there to the garden. We're just picking shit out. We're picking. Not, none of the stuff that we're picking should necessarily, like, like exist wonderfully, joyfully, um, incredibly by itself, right? The whole point of what we're going to do is going to ask ourselves what happens if we pick our garden and we place this next to this, we place something we smell next to something we feel in ways that we haven't done before, we haven't given our time to. I think it gets a little harder right here emotionally though. So the next sentence is what is the most terrifying sentence that you've heard at home? And again, when we say here, we mean for some people, it might mean literally you heard it. For other people, it might mean, you know, a sentence that you've seen signed to you. Another, for other people, it might just be a sentence that you've, you've experienced being communicated. But what is the most terrifying sentence you've heard slash seen signed or have seen communicated uh, or been communicated to you at home? Savannah says, I'm still on taste. If you're still on taste, that's all good. You know, we're building and, and, and we, we're just building. I'm giving us some like building blocks to build. <laughs> you might still be on taste uh, and that's fine. Again, these sentences and these questions aren't going anywhere. Okay. So, but, but, but what we want to, what I want to do at this point in the exercise, y'all, uh, as, as a group, is um, I want to give the opportunity to three to five people, you know, just if you don't have to do any of this at all. If there are three or, or let's say up to five people that would like to um, tell us some of the words you use to describe some of the sensory stuff at home, the feel, the taste, or the smell, if you could rate, if there's, if there's, if there's nobody who wants to do it, we don't have to do it. Um, but if you, if there are, just please. Okay, Crystal, I see your hand up. Crystal, talk to us. Let us know what you're working on. Um, for the 10 words to describe something that you've only smelled at home, I wrote the things and then I wrote the words to describe those things, if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, so I have elegance. And for elegance, that was uh, fashion fair powder and Trezor perfume. <laughs> That's good. Um, I have fried, which is 
specifically fried bologna. Mm-hmm. Just throwing fried bologna on a hot plate. I have refined, and that's for Yardley's lavender soap. Yes. Um, I have comfort for baby powder. I have fresh for Irish spring soap. I have shame um, for burning hair, the smell yeah. of a hot comb. Yeah. And then I have aspiration for the smell of like a relaxer on my head. <laughs> I love it. Right now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, that's it. That's all I got. You that's was it. them out there. I was trying to keep up. No, you, I, that, got you, I got you. this stuff there and then I got to the other stuff. I love how you have like the general word and then and then we, you know, you can actually compare like the feeling for us as listeners to like the general word versus the actual concrete, you know? I started with the thing and I was like, oh, wait, no, he said the word. And I was like, let me go back and figure out why those things, what they bring up in me. So that's what I was doing. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you for starting us off, fam. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have three people up here. Uh, I want to make sure I pronounce your your your, your name right. Anxiety. Ah, yes, that is perfect. Anxiety. Okay, so we're gonna go anxiety, Taj, uh, Sharita, and we're gonna go back to then we're gonna keep building. Okay, anxiety. Go ahead. Um, I, I my better list was uh, the ten things you only feel at home, mm. and I I went with emotions, not textures okay okay so um i got sodden weight i'm not sure that's a word but anyway um weighted disjointed dangling catapulted encased suspended engulfed swimming and floating oh my goodness gracious oh i want to make something out of those words fam the catapult. I mean, like so many of those words imply imply weightedness, but also floating, like a lack of weight, a lack of gravity. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk they, a bit about that? Um. Well, I have. You know, I don't admit this to many people, but um, I we my I raised my family in the house that I'm still in. Yeah. And this is our fortieth year in this house. Yes. So, uh, my son came here when he was three months old and the other son was uh, not even a thought right. so so and we're still in this house yes. so there is you know everywhere I am in this house it I'm in the past and the present I feel you. Right. all the time right. and and those words when I said them out loud they sounded kind of a lot of them sounded like it was going to a bad place but really it's just the impact of like memory yes perpetual you know memory thought all of that absolutely absolutely and and i love how i love siding you know like you know so much of what we do on the page we do we do orally like orally right so talk talk about siding why was that the first one yeah i'm not i i think it's because i just saw i i i've just seen i saw my one my younger son on sunday night and I spent time on last Thursday with my oldest son. And it's just, we're, we're at this point, like they're full out adults. Right. And we're building a new relationship where we're, yeah. we're all creative people and we're working on something together. I feel that. For the first time yeah. ever. And, yeah. and it's just like, as a mother, I feel like I'm always just like soaked in their whole life essence, even yeah. now. But now that we're working together as adults, it's just yeah. like I'm just sort of soaked in this magical. I love new, it. Like, like who? Yeah. Like this was off the charts. This kind of relationship. Yes. I and so that. it just like I'm flooded by it. it's it's all this water imagery. I don't know. It is. It is, and it and you know I'm always trying to figure out in my own work the difference between um, floating and falling. And, and, and like, you know, every book I write, I'm actually trying to figure that out. And I, and I don't, I can't figure it out. And I think that's what keeps me writing, but I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to keep on moving, but I thank you for giving us like the ability to grasp the paradox of sort of like moving on, right? Like moving on with family in a space. Yeah. 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 I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. All right. So let's go Taj and then Sharita. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't have nearly 10 words for, for each and they're not even really 
I mean, they, they aren't as concrete as maybe they, they should be, but, um, and, then, and then I guess the other only, the only other thing is home, home for me is just kind of like fleeting space. Yeah. I'm writing about home specifically as, uh, as this basketball court that I would visit when I first moved wow. to the place I guess I consider home. Um, yeah. So I, I smell, uh, I smell new sweat uh, and uh, I, I taste salty sweat. I, I taste new spit and ice for Gatorade together. Yeah. Uh, I feel, uh, I feel bumpy leather. Uh, I feel new sweaty bodies. I feel a combination of gravel and blood. Uh, I feel wanted. I feel home. I feel concrete burns. Oh my goodness gracious. I, I love that, you know, you took the, the exercise to use home as mobile metaphor. Like you, you took that, right? And, 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 and new sweat, right? Like I always talk about the importance of bursting cliche. And I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure that I, I know what that, what new sweat is, but I think I do, right? But so talk to me about more about new sweat. So, it, you know, I, I know what my sweat feels like, but when you're bumping bodies, you're playing ball yeah. playing against strangers. I've never felt their sweat before. I've never felt their body before. Yeah. This is the one safe space where I can, I can feel that for the first time. I love it. I love it, fam. And this is about you, not about me, but I, sometimes I think it's important for us to let people know what their work evokes. And, you know, I used to pull out of basketball and I haven't played in a long time because my hips are, are messed up. And sometimes people like asking me what you, what you miss about basketball and they assume it's the endorphins or they assume it's like, you know, the camaraderie in the community. And it is that. But when you said being wanted, listen, like that is something we don't talk about enough, right? Like being wanted, being, even if you're the last person chosen, somebody chose you that day. Talk about that for a second. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this might be cheating a, a little bit, but um, the, 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 some of the most joyful sentences for me that, sort of that, that were conjured to me were like, uh, you want to run or he can shoot. Right. If I don't right. know anybody on the court, but I hear out loud, you know, with this exclamatory, oh, he can shoot. I, yeah. I feel, I feel important that day. I feel like, okay, it's, feel it's, that. it's sort of a place, the place where the practice is starting to yes. manifest, you know? So it right. makes me feel around just strange people. It makes me feel wanted, but also like loved a little bit, you know? Absolutely. I don't know that, that might be cliche, but it, 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 it feels well, I know. what I imagine love. And, and the other part of that, and then I want to make sure we get to Sharita, is that in that, in that basketball place that some of us have called home, though we can talk about it in these sort of like sentimental ways, that's also a spot where some of us cheat. Like sometimes the ball goes off of us and we literally are like, I don't know who to, you know, foul, <laughs> right? Like, so, 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 so it's also, it's, it's not simply a place of virtue, though it, though it, though it, though it can feel that way. I love, I love that. Thank you so much, Taj. Thank you. Um, all right, Sharita, and then we're going to get to the other, is it Sharita? It's Sharita, yes. Sharita, all right. Um, all right, so, so let us know what you're working with and then we're going to keep it moving. Well, the first thing I loved is that you said mining your memories. And when I wrote the cover copy for my book, I used that phrase, mining her memories. Wow. So I was like, oh my goodness, I'm with the right guy. Shoot, so, I'm with the right person. <laughs> I picked yes. So for smell, I did an anthropology candle, fresh lavender, Ooh. my sheets, crayons, cheese. I eat too much cheese. Snow, flatulence, and bacon. Ooh, I love yeah. how you said my sheets. Do you know what I mean? Out of, out of all of, out of all of that list is like the one the one to me that like like brings me brings me in the most is like my sheets. I'm not about to tell you how many. What is it? Uh, count. I'm not talking about the thread count. They are my sheets. Talk to me about my sheets. My my sheets are personal to me. You know how your sheets have their own smell and their own welcoming. And you know, right now I still have flannel sheets on the bed, and you know I have some. My flannel sheets now have polka dots on them. I have my special snowman flannel sheets, yes. and they're just my own comforting sheets that yeah. I get up under and I like. I love, I love that. I love that so, so, so much. Somebody said my yeasty pillow. I, just, <laughs> I feel that. Okay, can you talk about, let's talk about someone, which of, of that list, which ones were the easiest, which ones were the hardest for you to, to, to describe? Well, the anthropology candle was the first thing uh -huh. because 
we were supposed to say something that was, you know, that, that was just in our house. Right. So there is a candle that my daughter has, and it has one of the best smells that yeah. I've ever smelled. And so that's unique to my home. Yes. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I feel it. I don't know why I see the, I smell, I smell brown. I never, I've never thought about that sentence before, but I smell brown in, in that description. But um, I need to think about what that actually means. I smell brown though in that description. So anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Sharia. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I, thank I, I can't make more lists. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I made more, more lists. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. I, I can stop. <laughs> it, it's up to you. Yes, I like doing this. <laughs> okay. I'll just do them fast. My okay. taste ones were toothpaste, mouthwash, cheese again, pills, the air post rain, and bacon. Bacon Ooh. is a through line in my life. Ooh. And <laughs> for feel, I wrote peace, relaxation my plants, my special blanket, and my purpose. Again, we get that immediate like concrete thing that 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 kind of protects you from the rest of the of the world, right? Not mm -hmm. this time before is the is the sheet. Now it's 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 the blanket. Um <laughs> I love that. And you know like so just listening to that list makes I mean I want I want to read some about the the blanket, the sheets and that cheese because that cheese just will not that cheese will not hide. <laughs> that, that cheese, that cheese said, you gonna you gonna write about me here and here. Um yeah, and I would want to know what kind of cheese. And then you start talking about the flashlights earlier. Like that's that's the kind of writing I like, soulful writing. That's it. Um, all right, thank you so much. Thank and thank the bacon, you. you know, right? The and that bacon, yeah. Um, all right, y'all. So we we're building, right? And you see, you know, you look at you look look at your fellow classmates. You see, they're building. I know you're building too. So I've asked you to do the concrete words for what you feel, what you taste, what you smell. I've asked you to do the joyful and affirming sentence that you, that you might have heard or communicated um, at home. I've asked about the most terrifying sentences, and this is where I think the exercise gets them a lot harder, at least for me. So all of those, all of this is like, we're still, we're picking our garden. We got a lot of stuff from the garden. We're putting it on, on our porch. If you stay where we stay, we would just bring shit, put it all on the porch before we moved it to grandmama's table. Now I want you to do, use no more than three sentences to describe the most wonderful silence that you've heard at home. Use no more than three sentences to describe the most wonderful silence you've heard, quote unquote, heard, experienced at home. So use no more than three sentences to describe the most wonderful silence you've experienced at home. And again, these sentences at this point, they don't need to be grammatically correct. Um, they might not even need to make a lot of sense to anyone but you. But I want you to try to get three sentences that describe the most wonderful silence you've experienced at home.
and again, keep working on that, you know, if, until you until you get the three sentences that you want right now, till you find those three sentences that again we're just going to deal with right now. And those three sentences again are being used to describe the most wonderful silence you've experienced at home. And the next question, which I think might be the hardest question, is use no more than three sentences to describe the most frightening silence you've experienced at home. Use no more than three sentences to describe the most frightening silence you've experienced at home. I'll give you a few minutes to, to get these sentences down. Okay, so y'all keep writing. I'm just gonna talk a little bit through this. Um, so for me, <clears throat> whenever I'm trying to, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, or, uh, short pieces or long pieces, um, I'm, I, I have a hard time describing silence, um, which, which to me means I have a hard time inviting people into silence. Um, particularly because so much of my writing, I'm trying, I think a lot of us are trying to create like soulful, you know, even though we might not call it spectacle, like some, some sort of spectacular something, you know, to get people's attention. And in my writing, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in how we can use the page to convey silences, long silences. I think I know how to do short silences, but long silences. And in my particular home or the home that I'm remembering today, um, you know, there were a lot, there was lots of yelling, there was lots of, you know, um, lots of joy, there were screams of joy, there were screams of, of terror, um, you know, there was gun, the sounds of guns being cocked, there was a uh, sounds of lots of laughter, but the thing that's the hardest for me to write about my home um, were those silences, and sometimes that joyful silence and that terrifying silence, like the line is so thin between them, I can't even tell which one is which um, because of all at home brought, you know, sometimes the silence would just be preparation for something that wasn't good. And sometimes the silence could be preparation for something that was like uh, ecstatic. So silence for me is, is very, very hard to write through and convey, but I want y'all to try, all right? Um, and so, all right, so right now we have picked everybody who's doing this assignment to some degree has gone out there in that garden. You picked all these vegetables, all the dirt and shit is all on them. We got them up on the porch. Now we're going to bring them up. We're going to bring them to my, my grandma's house. We bring them from the porch on a, on a, uh, on a sheet and put them on a sheet, bring all the vegetables in and put them on a table. <clears throat> as a, as a, as a, you know, young fat black boy from Mississippi, 
that shit did not look appetizing to me. You know, all I saw was a lot of vegetables um, that I did not want to eat. Um, I was like, damn, can you go in there and fry up something, grandma? Um, but invariably, she would, she would, she would, like I said, it, may, it might take a while, but she would make pickles out of the cucumbers. She might fry those pickles up. You know what I'm saying? She would take squash, something that I couldn't stand, do something in there, come back with some squash that like didn't look like squash, it tasted incredible. She'd take the black eyed peas, put that next to something else, and then we'd have something else. So what I'm about to ask y'all to do is, is bring all of these ingredients that you put on the table now and create a piece, but you don't have a lot of time, right? At the most, we're gonna have seven minutes. Right to do this because I want to make sure we have time to talk to. Well, let's get nine minutes. We're gonna have nine minutes. We're gonna to make sure we're gonna have time to talk back to each other. You all can talk to me, um, talk to each other, and ask questions. But here's the thing: in my own writing, I think direct addresses are like something we do not use nearly enough. In all of my first drafts, I directly address something, a person, place, thing, whatever. Um, I wrote this book called Heavy, which is directly addressed to my mother. It's not a letter to my mother. It's a direct address to my mother. Like the entire book is directly addressed to my mother. That book cannot come alive until I found the person whom I was most afraid of directly addressing. But sometimes when we think about direct address, I don't think we ask ourselves to ask ourselves what the person, place, or thing we're directly addressing is asking, right? So what I want y'all to do now is using everything that you've you've you picked, the concrete words for feel, the concrete words for taste, the concrete words for smell, the affirming sentences you've heard, the affirming sentences you've said, the terrifying sentences you've heard, the terrifying sentences you've said, the most wonderful silence you've experienced, the most terrifying, frightening silence you've experienced. That right there, though, that's our garden right there, right? It's gonna look different for different people. That's our garden. What I want you to do is directly address home. So home comes up to you and says to you, why? Your answer can only be contained in what you've picked from your garden. So what you're gonna do is create a piece that responds to the question asked by home of why. So every piece that we are making right now is going to at least on the first draft be initially addressed to home. And the question home is asking you, asking me, asking the, your classmate next to you is why. We have, to, let's say eight minutes now to create a piece that explores that question directly to home. Be as creative as possible, y'all. Home is asking you why, and you are answering why with what you've picked from your garden, okay? Everybody got it?
okay, we're, we're, we're never going to be done with this exercise, but, you know, take a, take a few more minutes to kind of start trying to wrap this part of it up. Um, though when, I don't think you're ever going to be finished with it, but just take a few more minutes and then we're going to open it up. Okay, y'all. So we, we, we got to be out of here um, by 8.30. I want to leave 15 minutes or so for y'all just to talk about this and also talk to me, ask me if you think anything you want to um, talk to me about. Um, but before we get there, I wonder if there are, let's say, three people who might want to share this draft of what they've written. Okay, we got. Okay, that's enough. All right, we got. We got. We got. Okay, we got. Okay, well, let's 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 see how let's let's try to get through these. Let's okay. Let's let's do this, y'all. So we got seven hands up. I want to try to do this. I want to try to go from Yvonne to Joy. Boom, like one after the other, without uh, like talking in between. So we're gonna hear like it's gonna sound like one big performative piece, right? So we're gonna have Yvonne. Dr. Shauna, Jasmine, Cosby, Sterling, Elizabeth, Lori, Savannah, Crystal, and then we're gonna end with Joy, and then we're gonna open it, open it up. So we're not gonna talk in between. We're just gonna go. We're just gonna listen. All right? Okay. All right. Let's go. Um, Yvonne, kick it off for us. I left 30 years ago. Moved away from your smell of pine and fried fish, onion-rich fried potatoes and onions. Surfaces slick with rain and salt, even when it wasn't raining, from your soggy salt overflow with air and the wheezing, yours and mine. Mm -hmm. Away from the electrifying joy, the walls of abundance, the piano scale laughter, the giddy bubbly comfort, the too hot, too cold air. Did you know the further away in miles I was, the harder, back, the harder being back was? I tiptoed so as not to stop bumping down, up and down spiral stairs. Careful not to break doors off of hinges again, again. The house was always full into the storm. And when I left, the rain entered you, flooded to bursting, so that when the time came to sell, she said yes. All right, Shauna, Shauna, Shauna. You did not rescue me. I waited every day. I did not want curry chicken and pear every day, but you insisted. Churn, roll, drum, lump, something about you never sat well with me. 
why did you keep closing in so suddenly? I just kept looking at my hands, determined to be full on empty. You warned everyone to leave. I have done it again. Mm. Jasmine, thank you. Dear granddaddy, I think of myself sitting in your green leather chair with the plastic getting stuck to my thighs, lingering like the thoughts of you. I think about the red wine vinegar that you slathered on your greens and how I tried to replicate them on my stove, spending hours soaking them and cooking them just to feel the closeness to you. I think of your words, are you okay? And how they protected me in the silences you were not a part of. How I sat under my covers, the light flooding through my multicolored sheets. I was safe in my head and adventures awaited me. How in the silence, when your son threw me to the ground, my ears flooded, voice constrained, eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And the reality of safety and who keeps me safe were broken. I think of you and how home meant safety, how you've remained my home, where I felt vulnerable and taken care of, seen even. I am seen when I light a candle and spritz my floor with Florida water, writing letters, remembering time in your garden, picking tomatoes next to you, hitting baseball with small Louisville sluggers. And then afterward, I would sit next to you over the covers and I would be next to you as you watch TV in your green chair. Over the covers, my God. All right, Cosby. Why? Why, I said? Yeah, she said, why doesn't daddy want me? How was I supposed to answer that? How was I supposed to tell her that the sweet smell of her crusty old stuffed animal or the bitter sweetness of our favorite chocolate covered pretzels weren't enough? How was I supposed to say that the tender slope of her nose or the weight of her hugs didn't convince him? I had to trust her. Her door was open like we'd agreed. I sat on the couch staring at the clock until the next check-in. In her darkest moments, mama saved her, he said. She was finally still, actually still at rest, unmoving. Her eyes were closed, her breathing steady, her eyebrows loosed from their furrow. The dog curled into her belly and sighed. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I got Sterling Elizabeth next up. You were lukewarm to me. Everything sweet was too quiet, fleeting, and the sour moments were voluminous, dizzying in a way that stuck to your walls, narrowed the hallways. Things were so slow. I couldn't stay just waiting for something else to embody itself. Mm. All right, Lori. Why? Because we're getting it ready for you. There's no power, no traffic. The kerosene lamp is lit, bitter earthy subterranean interred potion brew, Cthulhu choker mycelial nuclear. The rain batters the windows. It's after a crash when I'm in the bathroom. I feel my way along the carpeted stairs back to the wall. I listen for the breath of another living being. Roasted, rusty, crusty chemical funk Organic, alarming, cracked Patna junkyard vertigree up in my nose. You're in. Why not? You're ruining our marriage. I'll call the police. Maybe. Some, something else's skin, scruff, toughened, my undertread, barrier, buffer, mediated. Ooh, that's a cold ending right there. Uh, Savannah. Because I love you. You held me in these 170 year old walls, reminding me that thick air made up of unuttered grievances doesn't rate. Breath slowly slowing, stillness dropping through me weighty. You held me. Scented oil on skin once covered in salty glowing bliss, face caressed by candle and rosemary smoke. I inhaled you, you became me whole but not alone, bittersweet, lemon blossoms cut with day old shit, we're connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, showing out now, thank you, thank you. Um, so we got Crystal and Joy in the last two, all right, so Crystal. Because I couldn't be at home in my body while living in yours, 
because no amount of Trezor, fashion fair, or secret deodorant could hide the anxiety I felt inside of you. Because the smell of burning hair gave me the sh gave me shame as long as the now. Because Pop Pop said you're gonna be all right. Because I believed him. Yeah, that because that because is doing a lot of work in that one. I like that. All right, Joy, take us, take us, take us on. I needed to leave. I needed to fashion you out of the smell of her, but not within the fault four walls under the roof she chose for us. I needed to transport her from that place, from those rules. So I picked you up, a place I came to trust only within myself and traced her steps. I searched for her smell in New York City where she first met him. I sniffed out the flowery scent of her, sweat mingled with earth on the subways. I ordered the milky sweet black tea and dipped white bread rolls from the Trinidadian bakery in the Brooklyn neighborhood to taste you home. I flew to the land where she and I first met, where I knew you in her womb, Africa, before her husband's anger and the brutality of religion ran me away from you. His yells and kicking against my head and ribs, you not gonna tell me before Aunt Helen made you mine and said, baby girl, the world is your oyster and you always got a place to lay your head. Home, you finally said to me, never forget your voice, never forget your song. Listen, um, yeah, you can clap it up, child. <laughs> I mean, listen, um, I, I so wish we were all together, but if we were all together, we wouldn't all be together. So I just want to, I want to say thank y'all for those of you who just read, thank you for one, taking the exercise seriously, but also thank you for taking your life and your memory seriously. I think sometimes when we talk about writer's block, we can mean whatever we say we mean, but a lot of times I think we mean, you know, like life is whooping my ass and I don't know how to write forward, right? And sometimes like my, my sort of, way into and around writer's block is when I have to try to describe the block. And often the block is me. And for me, often that block is connected to like conceptions or uh, imaginations of home. So I have to do this exercise literally to get myself unblocked. And in doing the exercise, I find pieces of language that I can use for essay, for a short story, sometimes just for stuff for myself. But what y'all did in less than 45 minutes, is create whole pieces that moved me. And I know moved a lot of other people in here. And, 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 and like, sometimes, you know, it's not just about moving other people. It's about sometimes writing work that can see you. And so many times when y'all were reading, like I wanted to move because the shit was seeing me too much. You know, and it wasn't just like all your eyes. It was just like the, the, the pieces were seeing me. Um, so anyway, I just want to thank y'all for taking the exercise seriously. I was told I needed to leave, leave enough time for questions and answers, anything like that. So we have like, um a few minutes you have like 15 minutes i think so if you have if you have any questions or, or anything like that um I, I i'm not sure do you we went over this before we got home but i forgot now i don't know if you should put them in the chat or if you should let somebody feel free to do, okay feel free there you go thank you um feel free to drop your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function um, this is this has been beautiful and wonderful, y'all. I, I really don't even want to talk, but if y'all want me to say anything, I can. Uh, Jasmine, you have your hand. I see uh, on my thing. I see your hand up. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I have a question, um, and it's about heavy in particular because it was the first book that I felt seen because my mom is a highly educated broke person who works at HBCU. So my question would be, how would you see yourself in terms of class? Because I, it's hard to describe my life to people because Ooh. my mom's a professor, but I was very, very broke and there were always on my door. So how would you think yourself in terms of class and how do you, yeah. how would you describe that? Okay, see, fam, that's, 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 that's like an, I mean, that's a hard question to answer in front of all of these people. I mean, and, and I know I write books, but I write books because like, let me tell you why that's a hard question. Because like when I was growing up, my mama was a uh, political science professor. 
And, and for most of my childhood, she hadn't finished her dissertation yet. But nobody around my way knew what the fuck that meant. They just saw her on TV sometimes doing political prognostication. They would see her writing an article. And so, and you know, back in the 90s and the 80s, if your mama was on TV, you were rich. Now, she worked at Jackson State University, right? And they had these things sometimes called furloughs, which meant like, you ain't getting paid. Or sometimes she would get paid via literally like, like in food from the grill. Anybody from Jackson would like, that's literally sometimes they'd be like, we don't have a check for you today, but you can go get as much food as you. So it was tough because people would assume that we had a ton of money because my mama was so visible and people associate intellectual quote unquote class with economic quote unquote class. And so for me, like part of my writing heavy was just trying to like demystify that thing and be like, listen, there are a lot of black folk, I know particularly black women in this HBCU Academy who are rich as anyone could be in what they give, but are not near about even middle class based on what they get back from these institutions. And my mama was teaching like a five, five, six, six, running an institute, being a dean, doing this, that, and the third. And everybody thought she was rich. And we didn't have money for bills. So I tried to like, not just like, you know, pathologize my mama, but I tried to like let people know this is a reality. Like these people out here, this, particularly these HBCUs who are doing this incredible work. Don't fool yourself in us thinking that they're getting compensated fairly. I mean, because they're not for the amount of work that they do. So I I I just always my grandmama, <laughs> my grandmama was always just like working class. So I always assumed that we were, you know, if I needed a coat, I couldn't go to my mom and I have to go to my granny. You know, which is weird because my granny didn't make anywhere near as much as my mama, but she knew how to fucking pull a coat out of a out of a out of a hat for you. You know what I mean? So that that's 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 for me. It's like I I, I never know now. That's a that's a harder question because now, child, I want to sit up in here and talk like I ain't got no money, but you know, that heavy sold a lot of books. You know what I mean? So I I don't know. I don't I don't like the class that I'm in now. I I, I like what it affords me. But I don't like to talk about it out loud. Um, and all my money that I make is not, you know, like it's still my mama, my mom, my auntie, my grandmama, my, my cousin. You know, we got to split our money seven, eight ways. But I but I have some money now to split seven, eight ways. And that's I'm the first person in my family who's ever had that. So thank you for that. I know you're like, damn, I didn't ask you all that, but <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> thank you still for answering. Thank, thank you. I see Taj up here, and then I see Christine after that. And then there's Rebecca. Thank you again for, oh, sorry. Oh, and then Rebecca, I'm sorry, go, yeah, go ahead. Thank you again for sharing, for sharing this, this time and space with us. Um, I, I'm, I don't consider myself a, a, a writer, at least not with text, I'm a photographer. So I, I, I try to, to take on a lot of textual practices for visual literacy. Um, and in that I try to read a lot of text for visual reference. And the question I guess is straightforward. Are there, I know you work, one, you work beautifully with imagery, but you also talk about how you reference specific texts when you're working through pieces. Are there any texts that you could or would recommend that either do really special things with image, imagery, um, not, visu like not visuals, but actual imagery, building imagery in, in the words? Um, that, that you could recommend or work with? Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> one of them is that this, uh, um, I, I have, I have, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because it sounds like I'm doing what, what people always tell me I should do, but I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable doing it. But I have this book coming out called um, City Summer, Country Summer. And it is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, what they call a picture book, um, but it's illustrated by this young artist named Ricardo Edwards and fam. When I tell you that like every page I had to struggle to try to make my words worthy of what this young brother can do with the image. Um, so I'm saying Ricardo Edwards more than saying like my book is coming out next year. You should look up Ricardo Edwards. Ricardo Edwards is just doing some like astonishing, astonishing, astonishing. Um, astonishing work. Uh, also, I don't know how many people are, 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 are into, if you know John Jennings' work, like John Jennings 
He's from Jax. John Jennings does a lot of incredible work. Like, and I think John Jennings just really blurs that line between like the sublime and the horrific, like so, you know, uh, John, he, he did the graphic novel for uh, uh, Kendrick um, and we're working on some stuff too. So like the, the immediate person that came to my mind was, 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 uh, was John Jennings when you, when you asked that question. Um, but I would love to also see your work, fam, just based on what, how you describe that basketball court too. So, yeah, thank you. So, um, how about Christine? I think she's next and then Rebecca. Okay. Hi, so my question is, I teach high school. I'm actually a high school librarian. And um, how much of the writing that you do now, well, let me see. How much did you have to unlearn from your K-12 <sighs> education to start writing the way you do now and and what was that process like? Man, that's a wonderful question. And, and I, I'm gonna have to be short because I could right. be so long with that. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I spent my K through 12 unlearning as we went. Do you know what I mean? Which is one of the reasons I got in trouble all the time. Do you know, like I, I was one of my, I mean, I, I was raised by a mother who was, <clears throat> you know, made me read and write before I could do anything I wanted to do anything. So like reading and writing were very familiar to me. And I'm saying that because reading and writing is not like familiar to most students, right? Like, like I, I knew how to read, I knew how to write. I knew what they called a five paragraph essay, but I also knew that that was bullshit. Like, and so, and, and I was hard headed and I was gonna let them teachers know. It's like my mama, she got what she wanted. Like she raised this kid who was like a critical thinker, but then she was like, I don't want you to be critical thinker at school. But I was just like, well, see, that's where I'm gonna be. The, that's where I'm, that's where I'm gonna be the most critical thinking. You trying to teach me world history, but we ain't learning shit about Africa. Well, I'm finna pull out before the Mayflower and just read till you kick me out of class. Do you see what I'm saying? So I was, I was pushed. I was pushing back. I'm talking about from. I mean, maybe I think first through third, I was fine. Right, but fourth, fourth <laughs> on, son, I, I was, I was not having none of that shit because I just, I just could not. I didn't have the words, but I was just like, yo, they are incentivizing us to erase ourselves out of our own experience. Like they like imagine, I mean, that's what school was in Mississippi. Like it's the blackest state in the union, the poorest state in the union. They never said the word racism. They never said the word sexism. They never said the word poverty in my schools. That's that's a bizarro word. So, and then when you write papers, you have to talk about how good the readings are but the readings don't see you. So you incentivizing me to laud this person who don't see me. And more importantly, you're telling me to imitate that person if I want to matriculate. So I, I did enough to get by, you know, I, I barely passed in college, I mean, high school, but I, and, and then when I got, when I got old enough to start writing, yeah, I was writing against all of that stuff. Cause I just think we just, we just, we just, I mean, <laughs> What we did to kids and 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 what we do across this country, but particularly in Mississippi, y'all, like, I mean, how come none of these schools now, you know, they just banned critical race theory in my state, but they banned it before <laughs> any of the kids have to learn about Fannie Lou Hamer. You don't have to learn about Fannie Lou Hamer in my state. You don't have to learn about Mega Evers in my state. You don't have to learn about Ida B. Wells in my state. And these, and these new laws are making it even less likely that you learn about the best Mississippians, but the people making the rules are the people who claim to be the people who love Mississippians. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like I spent my whole time, too much time writing back against that education, but a big part of that education was friendship. And I just want to say that's the part I think we don't value enough in our young people. So we informally educated ourselves for better and sometimes for worse, but that was the most meaningful education I got when I was growing up, it was like with my friends. So sorry for talking so much about it, but it kind of makes me not so happy. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think we want more time with you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. So real quick, can we have Rebecca and then Denise and then have a question and we might have to close it down, guys. Okay. Sorry. Oh boy, I don't know if I can go after that. But um, so my question, and I, I've been following you for a while and I've been listening to a lot of your gospel. Um, my question has to do with consent. Um, 
I'm a new writer and focusing on short stories. And there's one story I want to tell, but it has to do with a very abusive relationship. Luckily, a friendship, not a partner, sexual partner. Um, but it's someone who has warmed her way back into my world. And I just don't know how to reconcile that because it's a story, even just talking about it to you, I, I can feel it inside me. It right. brings up all the adrenaline and I get shaky, but I, I know, I, I don't, I know I can't leave this earth without telling that story. Yeah. But how do you, so how do you, how do you, how did you manage that? I mean, I know I've heard you talk yeah. a little bit about it with Kathy Park Hong, but I just, right. can you give me some advice about how to go <laughs> forward um, with something that has to be written um, when I feel like I don't actually have that many stories to tell and this one is yeah. something that I need to tell. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I could just give my 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 small opinion on that, and and it, and it, and it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna appear to probably be like contradictory, but you know, I I think we have to attempt to get consent from people who we particularly harmed, right? Like 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 I needed to talk to I talked to almost everybody in my book, but there were certain people who did harm to me. And my mama that I wasn't I, I wasn't about to try to talk to that that person like the person who beat my mama's ass I actually did try to talk to that person and then they said something then they said um I was like why did you do this that and the third and then he was like oh I was just trying to fuck your mama and at that point I cut the tape off and I'm like I'm not trying to get any more consent like I got you know this is this this is what you told me so I think I think I think we I think when you're talking about publishing Sometimes you need to get consent. I mean, you need, but 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 the other thing is, fam, like you don't need anybody's consent to write something. Like this is what I think. I think we need to understand. You don't need anybody's consent to write it. And there's so many steps before the writing of it becomes read. And what I often suggest people do is, I think you do need to try to get consent with people, but don't allow like your needing consent to stop you from writing it. It's like you don't write something and then all of a sudden a publisher reads it. You don't write something and all of a sudden your uncle and all of them read it. Sometimes we use this whole, like, how do I get consent? And, and, and I, I think we should use that. But sometimes we use that kind of stuff to stop us from writing the thing we might need to write. Writing it and actually, like, going back in fourth and fifth and sixth draft, drafts, getting consent, getting lawyers to look at something, that's a completely different scenario. But writing it, I don't think you need the person's consent to write it. Nobody's looking at it but you and maybe a friend. But when you start talking about editors and publications, that's a different story. But I don't think you should allow that to stop you from writing this, this particular story you're talking about. But Rebecca, go ahead and respond. I think you want to say something else. Go ahead. Me? No, yeah. I, I, I think you're, you, what you just said is right. I'm using it as a reason not to write it. Even though I'm not anywhere near publishing it, I'm using yeah. that, that long-term wish that it would get published as right. a procrastination or reason not to even write it is because right. I don't have her consent. And what you're saying is sit my ass down and fucking write it. Yeah. And... <laughs> That's what I'm okay. saying gently, yeah. but you know, I'm not going to be mean like no, that. But it's, yeah. No, it's You got to write that thing that please like write that thing. And then, and then, and then, you know, work in that relationship along the way, but cons you don't have to worry about nobody consent y'all until it's time to decide how you want to perform the piece for people. But that's different than the writing. The writing is the is something between you, your heart, your memory, and all of that. Get that shit out. And then that other question is a di different question that has actually like you need a different skill set, but it doesn't have any, I don't think they have anything to do with one another, actually. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, Denise, real quick, because then I have a question. Um, I uh just want to ask how you write through the pain. How do you, you're very courageous? All of you are tremendously gifted by God. Just how do you write through the pain of all that we've been through as a, as a country, as people, as races, as a nation that's really split it, splitting apart? You know, just wanted to hear that uh, answer. Um, I write through the pain with, with, with scared. Um, and, and with a whole lot of joy, with a whole lot of laugh, like, I, I like, I like to laugh, you know, I see like right now on my screen, right next to you, it's my fam, Deshaun. And, and right when you asked that hard question, I was like, is Deshaun rocking a do-rag right now? I can't, is that? Yes. Yeah. You know, so like, 
I'm, and this has been a lot. This has been heavy for me. But like, I, I'm, I'm a person who believes that, like, in the heavy, in the sorrow, in the, in the, in the terrifying. Like, I can't get in there as an author unless I find like the comic. That doesn't mean you're gonna see the comic, but like, I have to, you know, if, if it's the worst day of my life, or if I, I have to find the comic to get in it, and then you know, explore out, and then decide how I perform it for y'all, but. I can't I can't get in it if I can't see a sliver. And so right now you ask that hard question. Literally, I'm seeing my fam they Sean and I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's a shiny little brown do rags, tough question. That's how I get into it. So do rags. That's that's the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. I love how you say that. I love how you invited your friend, your family into that space. Because the fact of the matter is, Kiesi, um, a lot of people do have to write through pain. And these few years, it's been very painful getting through life and sheltering at home and dealing with what that actually looks like. But, you know, thank you for the exercises that you brought us tonight. And one question I have for you is, as you're walking through that pain, how do you, once it's written and you've gone through getting it down, um, maybe for no one else's eyes to see at the moment, but just for you, um, how do you um, revive yourself? You know, once you get that stuff down and it's, um, it's probably an ugly part of life that you just dealt with. Like, how do you um, preserve yourself? You know, yes, you um, find laughter, but what what happens next? Yeah, I, I need to I need to go to a workshop for that question because I don't know how to. Um, I think there's a part in some of us who believes, even though like I'm trying to create lush art that can make people feel a, a myriad of emotions. Like, there's some part of me that ultimately believes I don't deserve anything. And so I'm always, there's some part of me that's always gonna try to cut my own legs out from under me. And it's always gonna try to like self-sabotage. I'm, I'm aware of that, but I don't know how to stop it. So like, I don't know that, how to answer your question. Like I'm terrible at it. Like I'm, I'm, anytime I write something that I think is decent, I think somebody close to me, I think I'm, I don't think I'm gonna be alive the next day to see anybody's response to it. That, 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 that means there's a problem. Right. So I'm just trying to say, like, I can write decent books, I can write this in decent, decent graphs, but I haven't figured out how to make myself think that I'm worthy of this. I don't know how. And so and, 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 and the messed up part about me is because I don't feel like I'm worthy. I run back into the writing because it is so hard when at this point in my life, I actually need to kind of like come out from the writing a bit, which is harder now COVID world and just like be of people and be around people I love, like literal people, right? not virtual people, but I'm scared. So that's not that's not a good way to end this, but I'm, 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 it's the truth, So, but I'm, I'm working on it. Well, that's what we want always is your truth. And you know, let me say this to you. Um, we would like to invite you back to Baltimore because we, we want to see you live and embrace you. We want you to know um, that we're just proud of your bravery, how you stick it out, how you say what needs to be said. And while it's hard to hear and hard to read, um, you've made it clear that our stories are so necessary. It's so necessary to write our truth. It's so necessary to write the hard stuff, the unpretty stuff, um, the stuff that really makes us think and um, kind of um, doesn't reduce us, but grows us. That's right. I appreciate that very much from you. Um, yeah. You guys can unmute and just say thank you to this incredible person who's been thank there God. with us. Can you get that? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Love you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And thank y'all for the community. I hope y'all hope y'all sustain this community that that y'all allowed me to be a part of today. It's it's been um it's been it's been super super soulful and wonderful for me. And thank y'all. I appreciate this. Thank you. What's, so your hat? What's the logo on your hat? Oh, it's a Star Trek hat somebody gave me, fam. It's a, <laughs> I think it's Bubba Fett and all of them. I I, it's a Star Trek drink, but oh. Put on your city neighbor's hat. <laughs> no, I don't like let me say, let me say this before any, everybody leaves. We thank KAC for joining us. You guys, we need you to fill out those evaluations. They let us know what you need and what you want in this writing community. We are so thankful to have this masterclass, have this author. Um, please support his work, buy his books. There's three of them. There's Heavy, his new one coming out. There's Long Division. I mean, we learn from writers like him. Um, and we're thankful for writers like him. Please remember City Lit. We have two live events coming up. Show up, it's live. It was. It will only be our third, our second and third live events since November oh, 2019. Right. 
But thank wow. you, Daisy. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It was yeah. amazing. Right. PSA, yeah. who's in the portrait behind you? That's Alice Walker. Oh, yes. Alice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, y'all should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's Alice Walker. That's Alice Walker. Uh, you should get the new, the new um, 40th anniversary of, of Color Purple because she let me write the forward to it. And then, oh. and then she's too. And then, yes. and then, and then. And then I got this picture, but yeah, it's, it's uh, that's what that is. So. And you know, one thing about Alice Walker, what she has said that she we she had to live life before she kind of wrote the book that she needed to write. So she wasn't, you know, in terms of you know being young, writing it. She said, "You have yes. to live and go through a couple of things." That's right. You're absolutely Amen. Right. Amen. We don't want to let you go, but we know you need to. Thank you, Casey. Right, Thank you off. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. You. Please, please um, fill out those evaluations. Please join us at the Motor House on Mar March 29th and then at Buzz Boys and Poets on April 1st when we close our festival out with a bunch of poets featuring Jasmine Mans. But the Motor House, you'll see Christine Platt. You'll see Christopher Carter, who is a writing coach. You might want to just show up for that. A writing coach is going to help you spur on your, your big project. But thank you for coming to join us tonight. We appreciate every single one of you. We also appreciate you showing your faces and sharing your incredible words with us and just being vulnerable in this space. Remember City Lit, donate when you can. We always need funds. We appreciate those who donated beforehand. Um, but just thank you for being with us. Good night. Thank you, everyone. The evaluations in the chat. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Carla, you want to turn off the recording, please? Thank you for saying that. I appreciate